both kinds, I invite you to hear these words. The cup of the Lord is not to be denied to the lay people, for both the parts of the Lord's Supper, by Christ's ordinance and commandment, ought to be administered to all Christians alike. As we get started, let us pause for a moment of prayer. Help us this day to be present to you, even as you're here present with us, O God. Take the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts. and Make them to be acceptable in your sight. For indeed, you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. To our modern ears, it seems like an odd practice. Folks would come up to celebrate Holy Communion. People would come up to receive the Eucharist. And in the Middle Ages, they were only given the bread. They were denied the cup. And the reason for this practice was a couple. Well, there's a couple different reasons for it, really. Um, the first one is kind of theological. Uh, the reason why only the bread was administered to the people and given to the people was because they believed that Christ was sacramentally present in that bread. And Christ was sacramentally present in that cup. And just to kind of put it simply, uh, the church didn't want crumbs of Jesus falling on the floor, and they didn't want drops of Jesus running down one's cheek onto a shirt or something like that. And so in an effort to protect losing any part of Jesus, and a person came up for communion, they would just take a piece of bread and put it on their tongue in order to honor what they believed about the sacrament. The other reason, though, folks were not allowed to come fully to communion and fully to the Lord's table well, another reason had to do with the fact that they believed ordinary people, regular people, sinful people, were just not good enough to take the whole thing, to receive the whole thing. Now, I know to our modern ears that practice just seems odd. Uh, we're ready to dismiss this as nothing more than medieval superstition. We're ready to say, we're, we're far beyond that. We don't participate like that. We don't live like that. We're better than that. But are we? Are we? It seems to me sometimes we don't experience the full communion that God wants for us. It seems to me we don't always experience the, the full presence that God wants to give us. And the truth be told, this is true for me, and I'm sure it's true for all of us in a sense, there's part of our lives, there's part of us, there's part of something happening within here, really, that we try to hide from God's presence. And thus we lack the full communion that God wants to offer us. Now, the word that comes to my mind is, is uh, purity. Now, I know that word has some baggage to it, especially if you grew up in an ultra-conservative kind of dogmatic religious home. Uh, the word purity elicits some sort of feeling of shame and of of guilt. It, it's created a form of Christianity that's about denying certain behaviors and suppressing certain emotions, and what it creates basically is this form of, I would call it, religious gaslighting, where we deny certain things about ourselves and reject those things and other people, all in an effort to make God happy. Let me just be clear. That's not the type of purity I'm talking about. No, when Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God I don't think that's the sort of purity Jesus was talking about either. In fact, the Christian tradition is pretty clear on this. It says, Jesus was tempted and tested in every way we are, yet without sin. Translation. And I know we don't typically think of Jesus this way. Jesus had a lot of stuff going on. I mean, if that statement's true from Christian tradition that Jesus was tested and tempted in every way we are, yet without sin, then Jesus had a lot of stuff going on because I don't know about you, but I know about me. There's a lot of testing. And there's a lot of tempting. And there are a lot of desires that go on underneath the hood of my life. And so as we think about that, what does it mean to be pure in heart? Well, it doesn't mean that we're perfect. It doesn't mean we have it all together. Instead, what it means is we are willing to offer our full selves, our complete selves, to the presence of God. We are authentic 
before God because Jesus has opened us the opportunity to be authentic in this way. Jesus was tested and tried in every way except for the treasure says he did not sin. What does that mean? He did not let it keep him from God's presence. It did not, he did not let him keep him from abiding in God's love. And so today what I want to talk about is, well, what does it mean to offer our full selves to the presence of God, even though we have a lot going on underneath the hood of our lives? What does it mean to offer our full selves to God, even though we have these mixed desires and all these things going on underneath the surface of our lives? What does it mean? And the way I want to start by doing this is, well, taking a look at the Advent candles. Yeah, I think Maggie did a great job talking about the Advent candles. It speaks to the type of experiences that we are offered as we offer ourselves to God's presence. Now, the candles all represent something. Hope, peace, joy, and love. You can see them up on the screen. And a lot of the times what we mean by hope is sort of optimism. And a lot of times what we mean by peace is an absence of conflict. And a lot of times what we mean by joy is like happiness. And a lot of times what we mean by love is warm and fluffy feelings. Let me just save you a lot of time. That's all wrong. At least when it comes to the spiritual journey. Spiritual hope, not optimism. Spiritual hope, not wishful thinking. Think about it this way. We say, well, I hope, I hope that I get the job. I hope that the report comes back the way I want it to. I hope that this grief will just go away. I hope it quits hurting. But that's not the kind of hope we're talking about when we talk about spiritual hope. Spiritual hope is like, it's like confidence and trust that there is a promise buried in the present. That's how I would describe spiritual hope. There's a, there's a promise buried in the present. And what I mean by that? Well, it's a confidence that in the midst of our darkness, there will come light. In the midst of our death, there will come new life. In the midst of our questions, there will become clarity. Spiritual hope is like, it's like this confidence that we have in God's presence. We're present to the presence. And as we're present to the presence, we, we trust that, hey, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know if this is going to get better. I don't know if I'm going to find the answers I'm looking for. Yeah, I'm going to hope. I'm going to hope that there's a promise buried in here for me that it's going to happen. And I'm open to what that may mean. That's more like spiritual hope joy or peace a lot of times we think of peace we think of it in terms as a vacation from our problems we say hey i just want a little peace i want a vacation from my problems i want all the conflict to go away both externally and internally i just want to sit in my chair and have a little peace people have told me i come to church for peace I want a little peace that's kind of ironic because if you've ever been around the church very long we're not very good at being peaceful we're 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 quite busy but that's not spiritual peace, though. Spiritual peace is not an absence of conflict. It's not. Spiritual peace is like a sense of security in the midst of an insecure time. When the Apostle Paul wrote about peace that surpasses all understanding, for example, he wrote that line while he was in a jail awaiting possible execution. He says, in the midst of that, I, I don't know how, but I have a peace that surpasses my understanding. How, how did he find that then? Well, it's not absence of conflict. It's an awareness of God's presence. Same is true for joy. Not the same as happiness. Joy is like a sense of gratitude for all of life, both the good and the bad. You're thinking, how do you do that? Well, your joy is not a, based upon the events of one's life. Joy is not based upon, like, it all worked out. That's not joy. When the Bible talks about joy, it talks about we rejoice in the Lord. We rejoice in God's presence. 
We rejoice in that in the midst of this season we find ourselves in that may be difficult, in which I'm not very happy, I have a sense that God's unconditional love is still with me. Still with me. One of my very, very favorite verses in the New Testament comes from James chapter 1. In that it says, count it nothing but joy when you go through trials of many kinds. This is not a joy that's absence of conflict. This is a joy that's gone through many conflicts and through those conflicts has learned to trust that God's sustaining love will be with us anyway. That's joy. That's joy. And finally, love. Not a warm and fluffy feeling. Christian love is not a Hallmark movie. It might be disappointing, but it's not. The best word I can come up with love in the spiritual sense, surrender. Surrender. My life in this world, it's not what I want it to be. But I'm going to surrender myself to the, the light and the life of God's love. And then we light the middle candle, Christ candle. And what does that tell us? That hope and peace and joy and love and these things, they, they come from centering our life in that presence. To put it very simply, as we become aware and present to the presence of God, what we begin to discover is we can have hope even in the midst of our despair. We can have peace even in the midst of our conflict. We can have joy, even when we're not very happy. We can find love, even though it's not always warm and fluffy. When we habitually are able to become aware and present to the presence of God, the, the presence that the Christ candle points us to, when we're aware of that dimension, the sacred dimension of our lives, we're able to find these things, even in the midst of a season where none of it feels true. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about offering our full selves to God, in the midst of my despair, I still trust that God is with me. In the midst of my questions, I trust that God is with me. In the midst of my failures, I trust God's with me. In the midst of the grief, I, I trust God's with me. And in the, in the midst of those times where life's not giving me what I want, trust God is with me. Now, in the Methodist world, we call this process of becoming habitually aware of the presence of God, seeking to be present to the presence of God, we, we call this process going on to Christian perfection. We call it entire sanctification. We call it being perfect in love. How many people have ever heard a sermon on that? Yes, we have a few. Very good. How many people heard that sermon a few months ago when I preached a little bit on it? Right, okay. So there we go. Um, but what's that mean? Perfect? Entire? What's that mean? Well, it, it doesn't mean that we are above mistakes. It doesn't mean that we don't have temptations. It doesn't mean that we are exempt from dreadful things happening in our life. That's not that, what that means. Basically, what it means is that little by little and bit by bit, we have learned to put Christ before us. In my neighbor, in my enemy, in the events of my life I don't like, we are, we've learned to habitually put Christ before us. And I take this from a pretty good source. John Wesley, pretty good source. Here's what he says. The goal we are to pursue is the enjoyment of God in time and eternity. And I love the second part. Love the creature as it leads to the creator. That's being perfected in love. You're habitually aware of God's presence. Here's another real zinger. Here we go. On a roll. Methodists walk with God continually. What's it mean to be a Methodist? Well, they walk with God continually. The loving eye of the soul is set on Christ, and seeing God who is invisible everywhere. What does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be a Methodist? Well, you, it's like we say every Sunday, we see Christ. We, we put Christ before us. That's the point. That's the point. Now, what's this look like in a regular person's life? In Wesley's little book called A Plain Account of Christian Perfection, he tells a story of a person that seemed to experience this 
habitual recognizing of God's presence in their life. And it comes in the story of a lady by the name of Jane Cooper. Now, this is what's fascinating to me about this lady named Jane Cooper. Number one, it's the 1700s when he's telling this story. It's a lady. In the Anglican church and the society of that time, well, ladies and women were not held to high esteem. And yet he uses her as a spiritual teacher. Jane Cooper, here's her story. You can't find a portrait of her. You can't find a picture of her. You can't find anything about her except through John Wesley. This is the model, though, of what it looks like. She heard a sermon of Wesley talking about finding happiness in God. And here's what Jane Cooper writes about after, after hearing that. She says, from that time on, that prize appeared in view, and I was enabled to follow it after. I, I looked for it. And she looked for it, and she looked for it. She, she tried to find that sense of God's presence in her life, that habitual sense of God's presence in her life, until finally she realized, I'm, this is so beautiful. I'm happy in God in this moment. And in the next. And in the next. And in the next. Two things I'll say about this statement she makes. She was present to the presence of God that was not somewhere else. Here, now. The other thing I'll say about that statement she makes, just after she makes it, she says, and yet I'm still aware of my shortcomings. She says, she's writing to John Wesley, she says, I took your advice and I compared my life to that chapter in 1 Corinthians that you told me to read, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. She said, I compared my life to that and I realized all my shortcomings, and you know the chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, I know it, love is patient, love is kind, love is not envious, boastful, arrogant, or rude, does not keep in record of wrongs, hopes all things, believes all things, love never ends. She says, I, somehow I'm happy in God, but yet I'm aware of all my shortcomings at the same time, so it's not some ethical perfection. The final thing I'll say about Jane Cooper, though, is she says she's happy in God, well, she's able to prove it when she gets smallpox. And she ends up dying a very dreadful death. And she writes Wesley, and they tell stories about what that was like in her last days. At one point, Jane Cooper has a vision of heaven. She wakes up, she tells the people in the room, she says, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I was caught up in a heaven of silent love, she calls it. And then in her, in her last moments as she's dying, someone asks her this question. Do you dwell in God? And she says, all together. All together. Someone else asks her, do you love me? And she says, oh, I love Christ. I love Christ. This is a modern-day mystic. That's what she is. Modern-day mystic, who, whose life is like a, a childlike expression of God's love, echoing it wherever she goes. So how do we get here? That's the question, then. It doesn't happen on accident, folks. It means we have to have a, what I would describe as a daily rendezvous with God again and again and again and again. <laughs> and there's two ways in Christianity that we typically pray. One way we call it is active prayer. That's where we say things to God, sing things to God, and we serve God in our neighbor. That's active prayer. The other way is what we call contemplative prayer and silent prayer. A great example of what that looks like is in the life of Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa once was interviewed by Dan Rather, I believe it was, and Dan Rather asked her, she said, he said to her, how do you pray, Mother Teresa? And, and Mother Teresa says, oh, I listen to God. And Dan Rather then says next, and what does God say? He says it rather sarcastically, and Mother Teresa says, oh, God listens too. She's present to the presence of God. We see this pattern of prayer. If you're going to take Jesus seriously, we see this pattern of prayer, this silent prayer, this listening to God. We see it in Jesus' life, too. After Jesus is baptized, what happens to him? Goes into the wilderness. What's he do there? Well, he sits for 40 days. 
Other places in the gospel, it says after he gets really busy, it says he prays all night long. He listens to the presence of God. Present to the presence of God. Now, if you're like me, that's hard. I tried it before, and it's like you sit and you try to be present to the presence of God, and what happens? Well, you, your mind begins to, to bounce around like a ping pong ball. You begin to think about, well, I need to do this at work. I'm anxious about that. I'm angry at them. I'm fearful about this. And the reason why we don't like silence, we shift in our seat when we get silence, is because all of a sudden when we're silent, we become aware of all this. And rather than do anything about it, what do we do? We just get busy. And so what are we going to do with all this stuff that happens within our lives, underneath the surface of our life? Well, the invitation of the gospel is confess it. Oh, there's anxiety again. Oh, there's fear again. Oh, there's that mistake that I made. We confess it. And over time, what begins to happen as we confess it is we learn that we can have these experiences, but we don't have to be them. Until we confess this, though, we're doomed just to be like a dog chasing its tail over and over again. And even worse, what happens is we use our religion to affirm our anxiety, our fear, and our anger. You've seen it happen, I've seen it happen. We create a God in our own image that's anxious about the same things we're anxious about, angry about the same things we're angry about, does not like the same people we don't like. But what begins to happen when we spend time in silent prayer, silencing ourselves in the presence of God, is we begin to come to terms with our own pain, and then we're able to embrace other people in their pain. I ask a few friends in the church to talk about their own experience of silent prayer. And uh, here's just a few testimonies real quick, and I'll wrap it up. I said, what happens in silent prayer? What's the gift it's given you? And well, one person says, it gives me the capacity to breathe underwater. Another one. It's the difference between reading about someone and knowing that someone. Another one. God seems nearer, and I notice things that I didn't know were bothering me. Maybe silence is not your thing. The point is not actually just to sit in silence. The point is to offer ourselves to God's presence fully so that God might silence us. How do we become present to the presence of God in that way? Well, I'll just offer a few quick suggestions before I close. The first one is when you wash your hands, remember your baptism. Be present to the presence of God. When you eat the meal, think of it as communion. Be present to the presence of God. Before you get out of the car, take a moment of it, just silence. Ask yourself, how am I feeling in this moment? and confess it. The goal is to keep Christ before us in all we do and to allow that light to shine through in various ways until, well, ultimately the hope is we begin to see Christ wherever we go. It's in light of that, I'll invite the praise team to come and we'll sing our closing song.